genetically understood. Hey there, folks. Mark Edwards here. And you're watching the Reasoning Aloud YouTube channel and podcast. And on today's episode, I have the pleasure of talking to St. Andrew. Now, Andrew is a young content creator from the island nation of Trinidad and Tobago, uh, just off the coast of Venezuela, I believe. And he has a really awesome YouTube channel where he talks about anarchism, anarchist theory, solar punk, and just having a positive revolutionary attitude in the world today. Uh, and I was really, really happy to have him uh, have the time to come on and talk to me. Originally, we had planned to spend a lot of time talking about those specific subjects, uh, and we wound up veering away from that pretty quickly, uh, which is perfectly fine. As we say later in the conversation, Andrew has a dozen, if not more, videos on all of those specific subjects that are really good and I would recommend you go check out. In the podcast, uh, Andrew and I wind up talking a lot about the various things that have influenced us in our lives. Uh, both individually and as content creators. We talk a lot about the younger generation, uh, the Zoomers, Gen Z, and how they're facing down this specter of late-stage capitalism that they've been thrust into, and how they're kind of interfacing with that and the struggle that they're going to have to endure. So even though we didn't follow the script that we had laid out in advance, I still really enjoyed this conversation. I like when things go a little astray. Uh, as Andrew said towards the end of the conversation, uh, it was more like we just hung out in a coffee shop and talked about whatever was on our minds. And I think sometimes those are the best conversations. If you're interested in any of the topics that we broach in the first little bit of the podcast, I would once again highly recommend that you go visit Andrew's channel. He does amazing work. I cannot recommend his YouTube channel enough. So go check that out after you listen to this conversation and get to know him a little bit better, so you kind of know a little bit about the young man who is working on that content. Before we get to the interview, I want to say a special thank you to all of my patrons. Uh, your names will appear on the screen now. Those of you who sign up for the Patreon, in addition to my endless thanks and gratitude, you also get early access to the audio of all of these conversations. In Andrew's case, and in a few others of these podcasts that I've done, audio is the only version of the podcast. Um, there was no video component here, and you know that's something that's going to crop up from time to time. Uh, for various reasons, a lot of the people that I want to talk to don't have access to a webcam, or they have security issues where they don't want to show their face. So audio is going to be the primary medium, but for those of you watching on YouTube, for all of those episodes, I have downloaded, paid for, and learned how to use After Effects so that there's a cool, like, audio spectrum visual that you can watch while you listen to the show on YouTube. As soon as I get enough patrons to support a video subscription service, you'll also get early access to the videos as well. So if that's something that you want and you want to support the show, please sign up for the Patreon. Uh, just a dollar a month is all I currently ask. If you can afford more, then I'm happy to take that. If you are in a position where you cannot support me financially, then please go out and like and subscribe uh, to the content on all the platforms that you use, be it YouTube, Spotify, iTunes. Leave a five-star rating share the link on your social media. All of that stuff really helps me in the algorithm. It boosts me so that I can reach more people and ultimately more patrons. Uh, it makes it so that this labor of love that I do can be financially self-sufficient, um, which ultimately it has to be if I'm going to continue to do it. So however you support me, I truly appreciate it. Go out there and spread the word. I would also really appreciate it if you took the time to subscribe to the second YouTube channel. Uh, that is RA Clips. It's down at the bottom of the page under Associated or Recommended Channels. And on that channel, I take clips of all of these conversations in short little chunks, and I post them on their own so that people who don't want to watch an entire hour and 40-minute conversation can just get the highlights. 
You can also follow me on Twitch, where I play Stardew Valley and just kind of vibe after work, um, if that's something that you're into. If you want to know how I feel about stuff, you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, I have a Facebook account. I'm less active on that, but I do still post occasionally. And on my Instagram, I post pictures of my cat, just as God intended. All of those are at Reasoning Aloud, same as the show. However you support me, I want you to know that I really appreciate it, and I really appreciate you watching or listening. And without any further delay, I give you St. Andrew. Andrew, thank you so much for coming on the show, man. I've, I've really appreciated it. I've uh, been wanting to talk to you for a minute. I've been digging your stuff, so thank you again for coming on. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Absolutely. Um, so what I thought that we would do is um, you have done a lot of work on your channel, which everybody should check out, uh, in explaining anarchist theory and all of the other stuff associated with it. And I think that maybe my audience might not be uh, as educated on that as they could be. So I thought that maybe we'd talk about anarchism in broad strokes and then talk about the black anarchist tradition specifically, and then move on to uh, solar punk, which is one of, one of my favorite new fiction genres and art aesthetics that you're into as well. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. So if you had to give your elevator pitch for anarchist theory, anarchist organization, uh, whatever you want to call it, to somebody who'd never heard of it or experienced it before, what would you what would you say to them? Like, how would you how would you try to sell them on it? Anarchism, to me at least, is the belief that people have the power to control their own lives without coercion, without violence, without hierarchy. Okay, and. Yeah, I mean that sounds that sounds really good on the face of it, uh, and I would agree. So, what would you say is? I'll tell you what. Let's spend some time talking about what those three things are. Right? You said coercion, violence, and hierarchy, um, and I think those three things play a pretty central role. And I'm not very well read in anarchist theory. Like I read the Bread Book when I was 16, and a few other things, but those three things pop up over and over again, it seems. Um, so what would you, how would you define, say, coercion and violence or hierarchy? I would, um, I mean, they're all pretty much interrelated, right? So um, hierarchy would be a order to things, I suppose, a, a method of organizing in which people are placed uh, are ranked basically so they have some people have more authority than others and it's not just that they have the authority in the sense of oh you know they have expertise it's mm -hmm. authority in the sense that they use violence or the threat of violence implicitly or explicitly to keep the people below them in check okay so that would be coercion basically using the threat of violence um, or th the use of force to control people. Um, okay. So for example, and I say implicitly and explicitly because it's not always obvious and that's part of anarchism, part of the practice of anarchism is digging a bit deeper, looking under the hood as it were to look at um, what's really going on. So for example, looking at the, look, look at the police, as an institution, really. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a more obvious example to most. In essence, the police are there to maintain the system. If you step out of the bounds of the system, if you, for example, uh, squat in abandoned property as a houseless person, or if you were to um, take food from a grocery store, or other petty insignificant crimes if you man man if you happen to like light up some of some buds or something mm -hmm. because of their role in the system 
they will use violence against you in forms of detainment or brutality uh, in order to punish your departure from societal, uh, but particularly state uh, decree, state ruling. And a lot of times these state rulings are there to um, maintain the class system that exists to protect the interests of the upper class and to control the actions of the lower class. So I think that's a pretty obvious example there. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. And even uh, not just, um, say, petty theft, like stealing from a grocery store, we had uh, in, I think it was Texas recently, where uh, the power went out and the power grid went down in my country. and uh, the the grocery stores were having to throw away food uh, because it was they couldn't keep it, and they actually had police surround the dumpsters uh, to prevent people from taking food that the store had no intention of selling and was in fact throwing away. Because uh, you know the system is based on artificial scarcity, yeah, and if it doesn't have that, if it allows people to benefit from the abundance. That their labor produces well then they can't sit back and profit from people's labor anymore no. and that will throw off the whole system would you would you say that by definition hierarchy has to contain within it the implicit use of violence or coercion or can there exist hierarchy without that within the uh, anarchist school of thought i i don't i don't think that there can be hierarchy um without threat of violence, implicit or explicit. So with, uh, with hierarchy and like implicit violence, I think one of the examples that I come back to is everybody understands that the state is, or should understand that the state is in an explicit position or hierarchical position over the individual, right? If you trespass against the state uh regardless of how arbitrary that trespassing is like smoking a drug that shouldn't be illegal in the first place uh do you mind or, if i um in this particular instance do you mind if i share a particular quote of mine well a particular favorite quote of mine yeah sure go ahead um so one of the first anarchist theorists i think they were the first thinkers um even though he's not exactly looked upon with veneration or adoration today I mean, anarchists don't really look at anything that is adoration. But um, one of the earliest ones is a guy called Pierre Joseph Proudhon. He was a French anarchist. I think he coined the term. Okay. And he said that to be governed is to be watched, inspected, spied upon, directed, law driven, numbered, regulated, enrolled, indoctrinated, preached at, controlled, checked, estimated, valued, censured, commanded by creatures who have neither the right, nor the wisdom, nor the virtue to do so. To be governed is to be at every operation, at every transaction, noted, registered, counted, taxed, stamped, measured, numbered, assessed, licensed, authorized, admonished, prevented, forbidden, reformed, corrected, punished. It is under the pretext of public utility and in the name of general interest to be placed under contribution, drilled, fleeced, exploited, monopolized, extorted from, squeezed, hoaxed, robbed. Then at the slightest resistance, the first word of complaint to be repressed, fined, vilified, harassed, hunted down, abused, clubbed, disarmed, bound, choked, imprisoned, judged, condemned, shot, caught, and sacrificed, sold, betrayed, and to crown all, mocked, ridiculed, derided, outraged, dishonored. That is government. That is its justice. That is its morality. Yeah, no doubt. I um, so I I I read things like that, and I hear people say them, and it, I I have a easy time understanding that because i have spent a good chunk of my life uh uh poor and uh working class and my day job puts me in direct contact with people who are on the receiving end of that so you're 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 homeless you're uh very you're like you're working poor you're people who have been discarded by the system and who generally receive the brunt of that brutality uh, I think that it's difficult for a lot of people who are middle class or upper class, when they hear something like that, it, it actually sounds really 
like bizarre and kind of out of pocket because in their life, right, uh, the, the police and the state and the system are things that they rely on and that actually do service them. So I think that uh, in a lot of ways, it's not so much that uh, it's not so much that they don't believe people when they tell them those things. It's that they don't have any reason to believe them because they've never experienced it. They're insulated from that. Uh, and I think that presents a big problem for people who want to change the system is the people the people who the system services have a vested interest in maintaining it, and those people are also blind to the greatest excesses of that system. Uh, so it's not even that they're necessarily actually antagonistic to you and yours or us and ours. It's that they don't even recognize that there's a problem in the first place. Yeah, and I mean, that's that's basically the purpose of their position. The middle classes, you know, their existence really, that precarious position they're in between, you know, working poor. Mm -hmm. And they basically, their role is to be above the working poor. And as long as they're able to be above that line, they have a vested interest in keeping the system as it is, even though they're more likely to end up working for than they are to end up fabulously wealthy. Um, the truth is that as long as they have some benefits, they'll be able to maintain it. And that's something that we see throughout history, really, mm -hmm. where you've had, um, whether it's being caste systems or class systems, you have certain people who are in the middle there who are not, who are not thriving but they're doing better than those who are barely surviving. Yeah. And yeah. as a result of that, because they have that tiny piece of cake, they, and they see that someone else has no cake, they empathize with the person who has no cake, but they're scared of losing their cake in an yeah. effort to try to rectify that. Yeah, and I think that's actually a, a case of, and that's a very good way to illustrate to someone that not like we've discussed explicit violence and coercion, but that what you just described is a case of implicit violence. Because if you are in that position where you have your cake uh, and you see very clearly, um, if you pay attention, that if you step out of line even the slightest bit, you will very quickly lose those privileges you will become poor, you will become homeless, you will become imprisoned, you'll have your freedom taken from you, and you'll become just like uh, everyone else beneath you. And that is, I would argue, and I think many of the anarchist persuasion would also argue, as an act of violence. And that is an implicit act of violence by the state to keep uh, those in the middle in line as well. Um, it's just a different sort. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So what um what got you got you into into this theory? Because I know when I was a kid, like when I was like fifteen, sixteen, uh a little younger than than I think you are, uh I I got into it because I I don't actually remember. Uh I, I remember reading uh the bread book, The Conquest of Bread, when I was like in a freshman in high school and it uh <laughs> that was it, my first as well yeah yeah the gateway drug um <laughs> and it uh it it made a lot of sense like just what what uh old pete was saying um and i i i don't i don't consider myself uh an anarchist personally i just i sort of identify as like a libertarian socialist just because i don't know how successful i ultimately think the anarchist experiment will be but i certainly think that those who are advocating for it should be paid attention to and listened to because they're offering at a minimum very valuable criticisms of the status quo as it exists like and are providing alternatives whether or not those alternatives are ultimately durable on a long enough timeline i think that people should be listening uh yeah i mean fair, completely fair i i don't i don't claim to have the uh the gospel truth i don't claim to have the way to Nirvana or whatever the case may be. 
Um, and I'm still in the process of learning and I always intend to be in the process. And even if somebody is not perfectly aligned with me ideologically or something is not like perfectly, uh, the perfect anarchist utopia, I think as long as we're in the process of constantly improving, evolving, learning, adapting, mm -hmm. uh, as long as you're not rigid and dogmatic, um, we have reason to hope. Yeah. I, I look, um, I actually really like uh gen z's energy right i think my my generation the millennials we were um we were pretty much predominated by just kind of malaise and like confusion we we came of age while we were realizing like the the recognition that the system was just broken uh is something that we sort of stumbled into as we grew up. Um, and so that kind of handicapped us a little bit. We, yeah. but, um, but Gen Z, like the younger folks, I mean, they're, they're just down in a way that I think our, my, my group never was. And it's really heartening to see uh, that just an entire generation of people who are so thoroughly fed up with the world <laughs> that they're willing to do pretty much anything to fix it is uh, just fucking beautiful to me. Um, yeah yeah i think um people talk about you know the youth of the future and that sort of thing but i don't think obviously people don't listen to you because if they did i don't think we would be where we are right now if because when i speak to my fellow zoomers yeah. and whatnot um i mean we we can see so not everyone not everyone's in, not everyone in gen z is like a radical like put a new system down a start with a kind of person but um at least a lot of us can see at, at the very least that capitalism is fundamentally broken um all of us or most of us are viewing the looming catastrophe that is climate collapse mm -hmm. that is slowly inching towards us that will likely envelop our adulthoods mm -hmm. um and that is I don't think, I think, I don't know if parents are talking to uh, Gen Z children. I don't know if um, adults are talking to Gen Zs that they know as a whole, really. Uh, even though, like, a lot of Gen Zs are adults now. But I find if you if you were to talk to them, if you were to reach out to them, you would find that a lot of, um, a lot of them, a lot of us, our decisions are heavily informed by, you know, shit's about to hit the fan, you know? Yeah. Like, for example... I think about where am I going to live? Is it to have water, access to clean water? You know, is it going to be in a sort of a region where there's going to be water crises or droughts and that kind of thing? I personally, I want to stay on my island because born and raised here in Trinidad Tobago. But I know for others, they look into what if we move to this place or if we move to that place? I probably shouldn't have kids because how am I supposed, how am I going to deal with like my child being like, I'm hungry and I can't feed them, you know, that kind of thing. Those yeah. are the kind of things that are weighing on a lot of our minds. And yet we're still expected to kind of, kind of follow the footsteps of everyone else of like, oh, you know, graduate, go to college, graduate, get a job, get married, have kids, retire, yeah. work and retire. When that's not even close to the realm of possibility on so many levels. Yeah. I um so the the millennial experience um I think is similar but still very different. So we were raised on the whole you got to go to college, uh you got to get a good job, you know the whole what what you just said, get a job, retire, buy a house. And then we went through three financial crises and like I'm 35 and I'm never going to own a house unless I become some, somehow wealthy, like spontaneously wealthy. Um Right. Like we, we very clearly saw that what we were being told was a lie as we were growing up. But the difference for the Zoomers, I think, is uh, that you came of age when it was clearly a lie. Like there was not even any pretense to it. It's just like, this is obviously not true. This is obviously not a, a sustainable way to live. The world is clearly on fire and a 
like on a trajectory to a global civilization ending event and everybody around you is just gaslighting you about how you need to like get a job and go to college and buy a house and retire and it's clearly bullshit but nobody not people aren't you even know what like, I, yeah my response is things like that what's that i've given that a lot of thoughts you know in mm -hmm. terms of the older generations in my life um and i realize that if you've gone you know 40, 50, 60, 70 years um, believing in this or having this system work for you, mm -hmm. or even if the system doesn't work for you, still being able to carve out some sort of space, some sort of form of stability, some stability now. Mm -hmm. um, it ties back to what I was saying. It's hard to let go of that, to yeah. be on that precarious edge. Because if you were to pull out that one piece is like Jenga, you know, all the pieces might fall down. Uh, I, I find it applies to a lot of other things as well when it comes to progressive issues, because it's hard for everyone to admit that something they've based themselves on, their identity on, their lives on, is a fiction. Yeah. Some people don't have the mental fortitude to handle it. But I think people still need to push past that because we can't continue living that illusion. Yeah. I, I, I just, yeah, I mean, absolutely. It's, um, the, I mean, we we're still dealing with it with the, uh, the older generation, uh, the, the boomers and some of the older Gen Xers who they just can't let go of this fiction, like you said. And, uh, they're, they're basically believing in a fairy tale, uh, that they're like, they're willing to sacrifice the world to continue to believe in it and it you know they're they're going to try to take us all down with them and uh i mean uh, and certainly a good number of my generation as well uh bought into that book line and sinker um to much to our dis our detriment but uh i i think you're right i think that it is uh it's almost uh, i'm i'm hesitant to say words like cult like because i think that's a bit hyperbolic but there is something to it where when you're in like a it's, cult it's classic like, propaganda you know yeah. it, it really is as someone who studied communication um has been into the belly of the beast in a sense because i've worked in media mm -hmm. um it really is like there's a there's a machine to it and mm -hmm. uh, yeah yeah they just you can't you just you've invested so much of your identity into this fiction that if you let go of it what do you have left to hold on to that is you uh yeah. and that's that's a very difficult thing for people to do and it's it's sad that uh a number of people are going to i think it in many ways a lot of those people are victims too right of propaganda absolutely yeah. absolutely because uh, i i look at people who are struggling to make an income struggling to put food on the table every month and yet they would still turn around and you know, talk about how, you know, um, you need to get a job or you don't need to get, get a, start, a, start a side hustle, a small business and work, work, work and eventually you'll get somewhere with it. But, you know, that's, it's a fiction, you know, yeah. you don't have the, if you don't have the capital, if you don't have the social capital to get you, you can't get you. Yeah. Um, well, like, what do you... So let me ask you this. You're, you, you spend a lot of your time doing these really dope video essays about like the good future that we could have. Um, and I think, uh, I think I'm aligned with you, uh, pretty well on that, uh, with the whole solar punk aesthetic and that dream for the future. What, what do you see as, what do you see as a productive? A possible future that we could live in that we could actually get to that would be sustainable and like a world worth living in something we should pursue um it, as opposed to what we're currently like marching blindly towards that's a good question and my answer to that is that i see multiple futures um i see multiple futures because there really is no global future right 
I mean, in some parts of the world right now, they are already ex- they are already experiencing the how that is climate collapse. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, we are all facing it in some ways with you know high temperatures or low temperatures or extra strong storms. But some people are already being displaced, already starving, already suffering tremendously, having to migrate and move because that's the situation they face. Up. Yeah. And um, it's it's rough. It's rough. So I, when I say that I, I see multiple futures, I mean, it's in the sense that um, each locale, each space, each group, each people, um, they're going to probably live differently. I, I expect to see with the breakdown of supply lines, I expect to see like a lot more localization. And I also expect to see a lot of migration. Um, but through all that, I also see the potential for adaptation. Because if it's one thing that humans have been really good at for as long as humans have been humans and even before then, it's adaptation. You know, so even in the face of crisis, even in the face of flooding, displacement, of lowering crop yields and uh, lack of water access, I still see, uh, I don't see a Mad Max future. You know, Mm -hmm. I see a solar punk future. I see a future where people are using a blending um local indigenous knowledges and blending the technologies that uh, we have available to us, the innovations, the creativity to carve a space in spite of it all. So you know like I expect to see um groups, you know, like spring forth in neighborhoods, spring forth in um rural areas and in urban areas. To see um, people who, as they wake up, they look to see what they can do, and that's where I see my role coming. In. It's like a lot, because a lot of people. That's part of why I did a video recently. Um, anti-capitalism is capitalist, which was a mm. deliberately clickbaity title, but <laughs> in essence, I spoke about the fact that anti-capitalism alone, it's not only easily can subsumed by the system, but also is it enough to take people where we need to. It's not enough to malign capitalism. You have to be able to be pushing, working towards and pushing an alternative. Which right. is something I strive to do. I strive to show people that in your schools, in your workplaces, in your buildings, uh, in your neighborhoods, even within your disparate kinship groups, you have the potential to have a ripple effect to have a to make a difference wherever you are you know to because all it takes is one person it takes one person to start the efforts of a community garden it just takes one person to uh, stand up um, to the violence inflicted upon us by the police it takes one person to look around in the workplace and look at the frustrations people have and off an alternative, it just takes one person to an education institution, work with students, work with each other, teachers and students working together to transform the way that we approach education, the way we approach learning. Um, yeah. I, I, don't, I never claim to be someone who has the answers. I said, you know, I don't have a perfect blueprint for how we get where I think we should go, but I know that whatever happens, and this ultimately is what drove me to anarchism in the first place, whatever happens, I trust in the cooperation of communities, I trust in the um, freedom and the creativity of the individual, and I think that we will find our way, no matter what. Yeah, and I I expect it's it's probably going to be very painful for quite a while. Um, it will it will yeah. be it'll be messy. Um, you will have spaces where people will probably be. You probably have militias in some spaces, um, unless people act now, you know. Yeah. And that's the thing. Instead of uh, this is why I try to focus on the now, right? Because mm-hmm. when you speculate upon the future, you kind of 
set the presence into stone in a way. Mm. And by that, I mean, uh, if you were to say something like, oh, well, you know, um, we're all going to die <laughs> or, you know, we're all going to starve or whatever the case may be, that immobilizes you, that prevents you from saying, I don't want that to happen and I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure that doesn't happen. Yeah, you kind of invoke fatalism in a way when you start speculating about the, the worst possible futures. Yeah, because yeah. we are creating the future on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I mean, I, I share that vision. I, I, I think you're right that we'll probably see... Um, I th well, now, now I'm in a position where I have to speculate about the future without speculating <laughs> about the future. Uh, um, let me let me just take a moment and uh, push all the doomer energy out of my body. Um, okay, well, trust me, I, I have days. <laughs> I have days when I'm I am totally totally out of it. I'm totally uh, pessimistic, and I mean it's hard not to be right when you look yeah. at the future you that you were supposedly promised. This is future you're going to get when you look at the species, the mass die out of species and the drying up of rivers and lakes and yeah. the flooding of species. It's, it's a lot. It really is a lot. But I made the decision, the decision that no matter what happens, I'm still going to be me. Yeah. And me being me involves not quitting. It involves always connecting with others and trying to help others to be selfless and to be empathetic in whatever I do and to be a teacher and a learner to carry both roles at once wherever I go so that's where I'm at yeah I mean that's that's beautiful dude I I, I appreciate that uh I think so I'm uh I'm like a a naturalist I'm an atheist um and where so it's extra easy for me to be doomer because as far as well, yeah, I'm concerned, um, nothing I mean, ac actually I'm, matters. I'm agnostic. And, yeah. um, that's part of why I'm so passionate about this, right? Because yeah. I genuinely believe that this is the only only ha chance we get. I mean, I would love to speculate about what happens after death. But the right. truth is that nobody knows. Right. And because nobody knows, I can't hang my life up on, oh, well, you know, someday we'll all be in heaven and everything will be fine because I don't know that. And yeah. because I don't know that, I can only work with what I know. Right. Like this, this is all we got, right? Like as yeah. far as the, the way I've always thought about it is, um, and I think this might've actually been like the first piece of content I ever produced was, uh, like trying to find meaning in a, an inherently meaningless world um is you know if you zoom out right if you you look at the universe as a whole then nothing we really do does matter in any meaningful in any in any way that you could assign value to it doesn't but if you zoom in right if you look at me and you and like our relationships with our friends and our family and uh, the world around us and our, our comrades in the streets, wherever those streets may be. If you look at that, there's something there that impinges upon us to, to be the best that we can be, not just for us, but for the people in our lives. And even if it doesn't matter in the end, like right now, here in this place that I live, in this moment of time where I exist, it matters to me. So I'm going to do the best I can do because exactly. what the fuck else am I going to do? Sit down and die? Like, I, I mean, I, for me, it's like, for me, it's like, so what if the universe doesn't have a purpose? Like, even if it did, you know, had some grand narrative, mm -hmm. I would refuse it. <laughs> and I would still be committed to the carve my own path and find my own meaning. So, even if we live in a meaningless universe, we still have to find our way, you know? Yeah. And I mean, one of the beauties of living in a potentially meaningless universe is that there is no external thing pinning down on you to tell you who and how to be. You get to make that up for yourself 
And if every day you wake up and say, I'm going to live for me and the people I care about and the people who care about them and this extended network of humanity that I'm enmeshed exactly. in, then that is the meaning that you pour into your own life. And I think that's enough. That should be enough. Yeah. Um, I think once you take your, your personal relationships and you, um, you define for yourself what they mean to you, you take a, because I don't, I don't know if, if enough people are doing this, looking at evaluating your relationships in your lives and seeing what they mean. Mm-hmm. How, are they, how are you giving to this person? What are they giving to you? Not in a, a sense of uh, economic calculation, exchange kind of way. Right, right. But in a sense of how are you helping each other to be the best you can be? What experiences are you all sharing together? How are you making each other's lives better, more meaningful, more enjoyable, more exciting? As I feel like once you focus on that and you even immerse in the struggle, you have people that you're fighting for and that makes all the difference. Yeah. And I, I have this like dream where, so like the, the globalism that has been pushed on us, um, as a method to sell new and different things to different people is something that I, I generally reject, right? I don't, I'm not a fan of that, but I think that there's a space, a potential space in the future for those networks of, of care and love and compassion that we have for our close relationships to expand ever outward into this, uh, global solidarity network of uh like of just humanistic concern for our fellow man and we can do that like the for instance like i think the internet is like largely a uh, value neutral technology like i don't think it's inherently good or bad oh yeah you wouldn't find uh, any primitivistics from me i'm very supportive of the positive uses of technology yeah, like I think, for instance, like you and I right now, like I, would, I never would have heard of you or met you. We wouldn't be having this conversation ever if it weren't for those things. And I think that there's a way to use these things that we have to better our world. And we just need to figure out how to do it. And yeah, I, hope... I mean, I don't know if you saw my most recent video on the... international solidarity. I, I did. Yeah, it was very good. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's that's, what I mean. that's that's part of why I made the video, right? Because I want to push people to look at the tools we have available to us to connect across borders, across barriers. My next video is on borders, actually. And it's part of like a broader narrative of connecting with people in different parts of the world, in different cultures, different languages, and building those networks. Because yeah. when you have those networks, when you know that you are not alone, and you have people you can call upon, um, like they have people you can learn from and take practice from and visit, connect with, that makes a difference. Once you've you've blinded yourself to like the local situation and you have like basically horse blinders on and you have sorry, not horse blinders, like tunnel vision. Mm-hmm. Once you have that tunnel vision, you basically stuck within very strict boundaries of what is and what could be. Whereas when you broaden your scope, when you look at places like the um, Christian anarchists in Taiwan, when you look at places like the um, the uh, autonomous administration of Northeast Syria, when you look at places like Chiapas and Oaxaca and Mexico, mm-hmm. um, when you look at the ways that people have carved out space and have made a living for themselves in the toughest of circumstances, that having that international scope, um, it's healthy. I think, and I don't mean international scope because I know people see international scope as, oh my gosh, and my my mind is just filled with the stresses of everything that's going on in every country or the genocides or the wars. Yes, those things are happening and it can be overwhelming to know about those things all the time. But 
there's also so much positive. Uh, one place, I would, one channel I would recommend that people check out mm-hmm. is Positive Leftist News by okay. Maxi. She Maxi runs that channel, and um, it's it's really good. It's it's really hopeful. You know, you have she shares workers struggle the successes of workers, excessive of the successes of indigenous people, of feminists, all these efforts across the world. She brings them all and she delivers them monthly. And that does wonders for mental health. It shows that our efforts are worth it. Yeah, I uh I, I actually I, I really like Maxi's work. Um and uh unfortunately I I encountered her work uh like right in the middle of this like doomer spiral <laughs> and I was like I can't deal with this positivity bullshit I've got I got to be angry about stuff and so I haven't uh I haven't checked her uh checked her out in a, a few months um but I I definitely do need to go back and do that I'm I'm trying to be more positive and uh forward looking and hopeful about the future and try to project that because right like even if i personally am like very doomer sometimes it doesn't do anything for anybody or the world to put that out there yeah right? that's it's, that's another thing i feel like once you have a platform you have a responsibility to, even if you're going through something like that it, it's better to keep that uh within your circle Rather than to, for example, and this is part of why I've scaled back from Twitter significantly, mm-hmm. rather than just put that out there and throw other people's deeds off and that kind of thing, you know, because um, it's, it's just so easy to complain. It's so easy to feel melancholic, to feel hurt, to feel scared, to feel that pain. But, and it's totally valid to feel that way. And it's definitely necessary to get that support Mm -hmm. but i had to wonder is putting it out into the void of the internet fueling the honestly like capitalist machine that is twitter or other social media that is literally designed to destroy us yeah it's not helping you know (laughs) Yeah, like, I mean, the whole of the internet uh, runs on, well, specifically Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, like, they just run, yeah, just runs on rage bait. And, like, unfortunately, like, left tube, bread tube, whatever you want to call it, has kind of veered that way, too. Fed into it, yeah. yeah. Drama Um, and debates and all that jazz. Yeah, I think I I, I did, um, (laughs) I actually, I did, like, three total like because i when i first started my channel my goal was to do like video essays and uh, do like long research projects and then covid happened and uh, most of my research i was doing i was working night shift and i got all my research and reading done at night when like i would get two calls three calls a night on an ambulance and then it's just when i go to work now it's non-stop so I can't read Understand. anything ever. So I was like, well, I got to, I got to figure something else out. So I was like, maybe I can do this whole like uh, live streamer bro thing. And uh, I did like three live streams and I think two or maybe, maybe two or three pieces of that are still up on my channel. But like even dunking on Tucker Carlson in like a performatively negative way just made me feel like garbage. Like it just made my day worse. Just putting that out there into the world. <laughs> and I, I and just like I think that's part of why um ever since I was exposed to this term, I've started using it semi ironically. Um, because somebody called me post bread tube the other day. <laughs> <laughs> and um in in a way I get it because if you look at that era, which I would see was like probably that 2018 to 2019, 2020, mm-hmm. um, when, you know, that, that real rise of all these different creators who were finally pushing back against the very reactionary rhetoric that was mainstream on YouTube for a very long time. Mm-hmm. Um, the... And that was definitely helpful. That that literally helped me. Those videos really helped me. But yeah. the ghosts of that format still linger, you know? And it it 
it's what it's part of what informed made me start my YouTube channel, right? Because mm -hmm. as long as like why keep focusing on these people? Why keep giving them relevance? Why keep exposing people to prigger you? I mean, I understand it's like entertainment junk food basically. It's like it can be entertaining to see, you know, someone's reactionary ideas get picked apart and learn something along the way. But when like seventy to eighty percent of the content is focused on what Tucker Carlson said, what Prager you said, what Ben Shapiro said, what Stephen Crowder said, it's it's draining, you know, it's not helpful, it's not constructive. Because at some point you end up with an audience that is, you know, cheering you on or whatever, but and pushing back against those ideas. But people who hold those ideas are not being exposed to it in their real lives, in their day-to-day -day lives. And people who are armed against it are not prepared to do anything to meaningfully change, to meaningfully challenge it. Yeah. Well, and I think that it also, um, it's just not a good way to to interact with people, right? So, like, you look at... Um, if you're always like performatively angry and like you know destroying your opponent with facts and logic and like <laughs> you know if you're if you're just eviscerating another human being intellectually and that's just how you engage with the world and that's how your fan base and your audience expects you to engage with the world when you go to talk to somebody who is almost certainly someone that you could or should identify Find common with, common yeah. agreement with. Yeah, like when you talk to somebody that should be your comrade and you just, the only way you know to interact with them is to pick them apart piece by piece instead of just saying, hey, look, maybe I don't agree with you on, you know, X, Y, and Z, but A through whatever comes before x in the alphabet uh i am <laughs> proud of the american education system my mistake or my fault um but whatever comes before that we agree on why and yeah yeah why <laughs> 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 jesus fucking christ um but yeah like we agree on almost everything else and you know if we actually found ourselves in like a genuine revolutionary situation those differences would become meaningful and it would be a very real problem but for the time being we're so far away from that maybe we can just hang out and figure out how to keep the current system from grinding all these people into dust and i just i i don't know that it's a healthy way to even in it doesn't build solidarity is what it, it just doesn't do it. Yeah. And that's mean, what I, we need right I now. I see the importance of pushing back against the uh, harmful, harmful ideas of people who are ostensibly on your side, mm -hmm. but at the same time, uh, because as I, I, as I frequently say, solidarity is a dialogue. Right. Um, and at the same time, I'm also like, if when it comes to people with larger platforms, you kind of have to um, engage with them differently than you would engage with someone one-on-one -on -one because of the responsibility that they bear as someone with a large audience. That's and fair. This is obviously influenced by my experience coming up against a larger um, creator, a mm -hmm. larger debate bro type. Yeah, that's um, it, how it, I... It opened my eyes to... <laughs> Yeah, no, that's how you exposed me and all that. Uh, it, it really opened my, that experience really opened my eyes to the flaws of that approach. Because, believe it or not, before then, I was watching that guy semi regularly. Mm -hmm. um, I enjoyed some of his work and that kind of thing. I always well, had same. some issues with him and his approach, but at the same time, you know, it, it's easy to, it was like enjoyable. And um, that experience, shifted my priorities significantly mm -hmm. and that experience um, helped me realize that my best approach to that is to not engage yeah my best approach to the, um to the broader struggle is to connect with people who are looking for 
constructive, mutually beneficial, enjoyable, enlightening discussion and activity. And um, that's, that's where my focus lies. And I just hope that the people who are locked into that um, more nebulous space can eventually find their way uh, to something that can more positively impact the world. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, I think that you're, you're correct. I mean, because there's, you know, you can't argue that down, right? That whole superstructure of that genre, um, because it thrives because on argument. It thrives <laughs> on, it thrives on standing where you are and digging in your heels yeah. and fighting and misrepresenting and interrupting. <laughs> it's just a lot. Yeah. It's not a healthy way to engage. Yeah. And I, I actually like that, that incident, uh, with you actually, uh, also had a large impact on me because I saw that and that was right when I was doing like my transition to streaming and I was not feeling very good about it. And then I saw that and, uh, what happened to Lua as well. Um, and I'm, I don't think I'm familiar with that. Uh, you should check her out. She's, um, she's, uh, uh, Professor Flowers on YouTube. She's a. She's, oh, yes. 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 Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, like, what happened to her? And it made me realize that that's just not, not only is it just feel bad to do, I'm sure that the people who engage in that sort of content creation enjoy it. They get their dopamine rush from it. But personally, it just made me feel bad. And two, it's just not what I want to put out in the world. I want to, I want to talk to people like this. I want to have conversations where I'm, having a meaningful exchange of ideas that other people can listen to. And, you know, if they disagree with us, that's fine. There's other stuff you can listen to, but I'm not, I'm not trying to hurt anybody. And I think that's, what's important. And I think that's what I want to put out into the world. And it, yeah, it was, it was a, we, it was an interesting transitional period, just watching that happen to somebody else, uh, never mind having experienced it, which yeah. I'm sure was very informative to you as well. Yeah. 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 So, and I mean, and to your credit, you've blown the absolute fuck up since then. So what you're doing now definitely was working for you. Um, I, yeah, I think I said this to you before we started recording, but, um, when I, I first messaged you, you had like 3000 followers. And then the next time I messaged you, you had 10 and you were doing a 10,000 follower Q and a, and now you're over 20, three weeks later, man, like you're doing absolute fucking gangbusters um it's <laughs> it's super dope i'm i'm really happy for you yeah i appreciate it so like what do you where do you see like your channel going like what do you where are you going to go with it like what's your plan do you um, have well one or... <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know it's very funny that you ask that because anyone who knows me in person um mm. knows that i am a compulsive planner almost oh. to a fault um and to to sort of show how I wouldn't say bad how bad it is, but for lack of a better word, how bad it is. Um I already have videos planned for next year. Nice. <laughs> yeah, I have collaborations lined up, I have videos laid out, um I have my videos prepared a month in advance. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Yeah, yeah, I have I have a lot I have a lot of things I'm excited, excited to do. This was one of them. This is one of the first things I had in my car that I was excited to do. And I have so many other things coming up as well that I'm looking forward to. Well, I appreciate it. Um I I, I hope you uh you get like three hundred thousand, four hundred thousand. I hope you uh I hope you blow the fuck up, dude. Um uh, <laughs> I mean having having that sort of large thing is it, it's tough. You know, it could it could be um overwhelming, but yeah. Um, I just, you know, you find healthy ways of engaging with it. And for me, that was literally adding a Chrome extension to block Twitter from my laptop <laughs> <laughs> and deleting the app and uh, add, and do that same Chrome extension, blocking YouTube studio and checking it only rarely because when it was there for me, I was constantly checking number go up, number go up, you know, <laughs> and it's not a healthy way to engage with it. I always want to focus on the work that I'm doing and yeah. to find that this is the approach that helps me. So, yeah, I, uh, 
Yeah, I, I um wish that I could afford to disengage from Twitter. Um, it like right now I'm, I'm building most of my uh future guest list through it, and uh, I try not to get sucked down into it, but it's just so fucking easy to. It's um, it's literally Vegas. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's like Vegas in hell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, and you don't even get any money from it. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I uh, we let's see. We kind of well, let's let's do this. Um, we've got a you've got like an hour left that you said you could talk. Let's um, let's let's continue in the vein of positivity and uh, try to end on that. Um, and just let's talk about like solar punk because that's a. Uh, as bright and shiny and happy of a of a thing as we could discuss. Um, so, just for those that don't know or who are not familiar with it, what uh, what what is Solar Punk? Like, I know you have a video on it that everybody should watch, but if <laughs> the you, exact uh, same title, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Solar Punk is it is oh, it's a lot of things. Solar Punk is a art. It's an art movement. It is a political. Um, I wouldn't say it's a political framework. It's more like it's a political dressing, mm-hmm. in a sense, a political um, framing, maybe. Um, it is a literature genre. It's an art, uh, an approach to art, an art philosophy, to, as you will. Uh, it's, it's a lot of different things. To me, it is whatever I want it to be. It's also <laughs> um it's 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 um a realization that the future's uncertainty is cause for hope mm. and that we have so much untapped potential and we can use what we have and our own ingenuity, our own creativity to develop the life and the world we want to live. To positively imagine collectively and to positively uh, and, and to collectively create as well um the world you want to see. It's a it's a it's a form that pushes against green capitalism, it pushes against um mere reformism of the status quo and seeks to put uh, a human face with dirt behind its ears to the whole future. Yeah. Um, would you, would you, would it be fair to say that solar punk is kind of a response or counter narrative to cyberpunk? cyberpunk? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It definitely, it definitely is. I mean, solar punk came out of steampunk. Mm-hmm. Um, and I believe steampunk was the original genre or was cyberpunk the original genre? I can't remember uh, right now. I think cyberpunk was the original and then steampunk. Right, so- Cyber and Steam and well, um, Solar Punk came out of both of those in ways. It, it really was a response instead of looking at, you know, corporations, super corporations ruling the world, or <laughs> we're all stuck with um zeppelins, <laughs> or whatever the case may be. Um, it's more like something that we something you can do today, like you can grow a permaculture garden if you have a yard. You can, or even just like grow some plants in some pots in your apartment or whatever. You can, um, you can connect with people and develop the groups, the art collectives, the community collectives, the organizations that will turn these ideas of, you know, like localized grids and local waste management and um, laboratory technology and turn that into something that people can see, people can live. Yeah. I think it actually, (laughs) yeah, I think um, it, it actually seems to like uh, the relationship between say cyberpunk and solar punk seems to mirror somewhat the, the flow of the conversation that we've just had where like cyberpunk it was always a criticism of the status quo and like corporatism and what have you, but it was very nihilistic. It, it's kinda, it was kind of, 
it was kind of the anti-capitalism is capitalist yeah. sort of approach in the sense because what i talk about in that video is really capitalist realism and that's what cyberpunk is right even mm-hmm. as it's pushing arc against capitalism showing people's lives within that framework within that system it is not showing an alternative yeah and that's that's what solar punk is responding to the need for an alternative because they even solar punk stories and they can be solar punk stories where people are in uh terrible situations right but the goal of those kinds of stories is to show that even those terrible situations we can find our way out of it like we as people as individuals and as collectives have the power to take ourselves out of that another part of solar punk for me is also connecting with the earth which also has a lot to do for me with connecting with um, learning more about my history, not just my island's history, but my lineage, my ancestry, learning what the peoples and the cultures who came before me knew. And, you know, that's a long, that's a lifelong process, that's a learning process. But I feel like pairing that with Sulabong allows me to both learn from the past ground myself in the present and build the future, prepare for the future. Um, so yeah, I think within my larger framework, which I call Andrewism, um, <laughs> I am the one and only Andrewist. Um, so the punk is a key piece in that puzzle. Yeah. It, it seems like where, like you said, like uh, whereas cyberpunk is uh, capitalist realism where there is no, ima- you can't even imagine an alternative to the way things are. You just have to endure them. That solar punk actually offers uh, a viable alternative where you can live in a world where you accept the, the flaws and limitations of the system that you were born into, but you have a path by which to change it. and to not only um to change it but to by doing so form a closer relationship to the world around yeah. you and it for me it's it's living the revolution basically yeah and it i i think that's a uh, just a very like hopeful and uh just really i think that's something that we need right now because i like i, I grew up on cyberpunk i was a huge cyberpunk nerd and still am right like i'll i'll never i'll never get rid of the trench coat um <laughs> but, but i i i can i can happily hang it up in the closet and go plant a garden <laughs> um and i i think that that's the direction we need to head is yeah getting I mean, rid it's... It's like that it's it's taking a balanced realism approach to it mm-hmm. you know um where you are not blinding yourself to reality but you're also not letting reality define you and limit you yeah. uh, i think it was it was Bookchin who said um what currently exists um the belief that what currently exists must necessarily exist is the acid that corrodes all revolutionary thinking. Was mm. it? I, I, I have no idea. I've actually never read any Bookchin. Um, but uh, that sounds... I, I, I struggle to read Bookchin because I, I don't like his writing style. But Yeah, I have... Uh, actually, if you have any links to any uh, uh, books on tape of leftist theory, like... Uh, I would absolutely love those because I sh- I have really bad ADD and I struggle to sit and read. Uh, but I exactly. listen, yeah, I listen to uh, podcasts and books on tape while I work out and while I'm driving around. So, like, I, I have tried. Recommend, um, well, yeah, there, there are people on YouTube. Um, like one people, one person, one group in particular, Audible Anarchist. Um, their quality varies sometimes, but they're pretty good. I've been uh like I've been trying to find a, an audio copy of the the wretched of the earth for probably like three or four months now, and I just haven't been able to get. There's one on YouTube that isn't exact. It's it's a okay quality, but um, so I could find yeah a better version for you. Yeah, yeah. If you do, uh, if you run across one, just definitely DM me, and I'll I'll be happy to get it. And I think that's um that's another right? That's another application of technology that I think is making things more accessible to people um, that we otherwise might not have. Like how many people, 
uh, in this world are perfectly capable of understanding ideas that are complex and varied and require nuanced thinking, but because of uh, a learning disability or a, uh, you know, just circumstance of uh, bad luck, right? They were born into a place and time where they never had education to learn to read or things like that. We like now that's less of a hindrance in our world. And I think that's something that uh, is actually quite inspiring that we've been able to do. And I, I hope that we can continue to incorporate that into, into what we do moving forward. I, I like that uh, there are channels out there like this where people are reading these things aloud uh, for folks. And that's, that's part of what I do as well. Huh? Um, I don't read books one for one, mm -hmm. but I take books that I've enjoyed and I've learned from and I condense them, I synthesize them with other works, and I put them into my own language. And that's that's basically my that's basically a quick and easy guide to making a scene town true video. <laughs> yeah, and I mean it's very effective, right? Like you get the points across very well. Um, and I think in a way that is very accessible. Um, even if you haven't read, like that's that's actually one thing that I I'm kind of annoyed by constantly with. Uh, other lefties um, is the uh, so I think it's important to to read theory if you can. Um, there are good ideas there, and we need to be able to pass those ideas forward. But... I would advocate for um, to, before, before I let you continue, I would advocate for actually skimming theory as well. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm I'm a I'm a firm proponent of skim theory. <laughs> you could read theory as well if you like, but you could skim theory because you don't necessarily need to read a chapter about 19th century political conditions. Right. You know, you could skim, you could jump ahead, jump behind, get to the good bits, read Cliff's notes or like shortened versions, condensed versions of the text if you had to. Like, yeah. life is short, time is short, and we have access to literally tens of thousands of books. Um, we're, our reading lists are constantly growing because every time you end a discussion with a fellow um, radical, they're just like, oh, you should read this. And you're like, ah, okay, <laughs> <laughs> you add it to the list. But my approach as of late has been um, skimming. Yeah, I, I, I do a lot of skimming. And I find, obviously, with books that I really want to digest deeply, I approach it that way. But for others... You just want to get the kind of general sense of the text is about your skin. Yeah. I, um, I've always thought that there is a, so there's a place for scholarship, right? Like we need people who, uh, have a deep, deep, uh, understanding of the body of the work who can serve as references. But I think for the most part, if you're, trying to explain something uh in a way that the person who is going to be doing the work can't understand and needs to you know uh just it, it's just so dense and arcane that the average person is not going to be able to interface with it then you're not actually doing anything productive for the most part yeah like the 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 union worker who is working in the factory who you're trying to unionize who is somebody who is perfectly intelligent who is capable of understanding complex ideas like any human being but who just doesn't have the the privilege of having that level of education under their belt you should be able to explain uh your positions to that person we, like as leftists, should be able to explain our positions to that person in a way that yeah. they very easily get, um, which is actually one of the things that I really like about your channel is that you do that um, without talking down to anybody. You're very, you're, you're very good at towing that line between complexity and simplicity, and I think it's very good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So add to what you're saying there, because um, I don't know if you heard, I was just literally like typing out, because what you were saying was really resonating with a lot of things I've been thinking about listening mm -hmm. to and talking about lately. Like, for example, lately with my personal book club, because 
if it's one thing I suggest activists do, it's, you know, have a dedicated group of people that you're talking to and connecting with. Mm -hmm. um, I would say in my book club, we have been talking a lot about learning as a group, right? We talk about shared learning because why have, I think, the issue with some people's approach is not only that they are approaching it on an individual level, but they're also taking an individual approach to it. And I basically said the same thing twice in different orders, but <laughs> let me let me explain. Um, in the sense that learning should be a uh, learning should be a group activity, should be a collective activity. Um, obviously, you have to digest it and integrate it into yourself as an individual. But this book club that I've had has led to some of the most insights that I have ever had in my life, the most insightful conversations and discussions, because each of us have different life experiences. We have a lot of similarities. We also have different life experiences. So we're able to draw that out of the text and discuss our contemporary situation and really benefit from each other's life experiences and knowledges. And another aspect of that is that, another aspect of, uh, well, we're in the early stages, but another aspect of our planned approach is to um, split up the reading in the sense of rather than having every single person have to read every single theory book, Mm -hmm. these sort of book clubs are spaces where one person can read this, one person can read that, one person can read the other, and each of those people can then bring what they learned to the group. So it's a bit of a time saver, um, mm -hmm. and it, sh it helps people to understand the text that they, that they just read um, and share that information with others. Interesting. Are you guys each reading a different section of an individual of a single book, or are you all reading a different book and then comparing notes? Like, what are you guys doing? So, what we're doing right now is meeting weekly and reading a chapter. So, one person would read a chapter out loud, mm -hmm. and then afterwards, you would launch into discussion about that about the chapter. Sometimes we only cover one chapter, while other times we cover two. But um, recently, actually, we started discussing how we can, because it's a bit of a long book we're going through, we don't want to like, get bored or tired of it. Um, we're looking into incorporating other books, and incorporating other styles to really tune our book club from level one to level 10, in a sense, right. to really upgrade and elevate it so now we're looking into like um uh, exchanging books now we're looking into um reading multiple books at once so alternating the titles we're reading on a weekly basis um, and we might also end up looking into having each of us read a book and then bring it to the group and share our insights from that and then when you hear someone else's insights, that means that may inspire you to read the book for yourself and get your own insights, or it may not. But it's a shared learning process. It's an egalitarian learning process, a level learning process, and a very exciting and invigorating learning process. Because it helps us to all understand what we just read and to hear from each other's experiences. Another thing I would recommend that people do um, with the book clubs and even with the individual reading is you read some modern theory. Like, you don't have to go back to the 19th century or the 20th century to get good information. There are a lot of people out here who are writing incredible texts. Like, one thing, one book I recommend to a lot of people is Anarchy Works by Peter Galdeluz. Um, And that's like, I think he published that a decade or two ago. Mm -hmm. But having access to that contemporary knowledge, that more relevant and modern text, is 
it's usually easier to read, it's usually more relevant, and it's usually more ap- applicable to your daily life. So I know we have the classics, the official canon, as it were, but there's a lot more to enjoy out there. Yeah. Did um this is kind of a weird segue, but uh have you played uh Disco Elysium? No, but I, I watched a video I see about it. Yeah, it was uh was that Curios by chance? Yes, it was. Yes, yeah, it was. okay. Uh so my uh I, I watched the same one which everybody else should watch. It was really good. Um and uh uh my partner uh played it and uh and I, I sat next to her on the couch while she played the game. So I kind of played it by osmosis. Um, but I think uh, that is a like a pretty non-traditional way to convey a lot of the same ideas, right? That's actually a perfect it. segue. That is yeah. a perfect segue. <laughs> because it's something I talk about all the time. Like, people don't think about it, but a book is not the only way to ingest theory. Yeah. Um, I know, like, it's trendy now to, like, devalue, um, like, videos or whatever. But videos are a valid form of ingesting theory. All your mm-hmm. books are a valid form of ingesting theory. And I, in my view, fiction is one of the best ways to inject theory. Because um, I want book I recommend people check out is The Truth About Stories. Mm-hmm. Um, he, sort of signs everything off with the truth about stories is that's all we are Hmm. you know and humans are a storytelling species right we've always conveyed important ideas through fables through parables through fiction through myths yeah and for some reason people are more invested in a lengthy dense political text than producing things that can actually excite people um, one thing I'm working on is a short story collection uh, inspired by Solar Punk and a couple of other inspirations. But I really sh- encourage people to read fiction books like hopeful speculative fiction. Um, look at like video games like Disco Elysium to learn like different concepts because people learn differently, right? Um, mm-hmm. Because of the school system, we've been taught to have a one-size-fits-all approach to education. But our approach should really be the opposite. Our approach should incorporate music. Our approach should incorporate text. should incorporate action. should incorporate gaming. You know, it's a multiplicity of ways to engage with and learn from things. And that's a potential that remains untapped for now. Yeah, I'm I'm really excited to see where uh so my uh my partner bought an Oculus Rift <laughs> um and uh I I put it on and I played it for like 10 minutes. I'm not a big gamer. Um and when I put that thing on my head, um the first thing I had two thoughts in rapid succession. Uh the first was if they're not already using it for this purpose within 10 years this is how the military industrial complex is going to murder people uh, is you're just going to, this is instantly like, this is the future of yeah. projecting. I mean, they've already console. started, they've already yeah. started like connecting Xbox controllers to missile strikers. So. Yeah. I'm, I'm just imagining, you know, a, a world where you effectively are the drone. Right. And it's, it's just horrifying. And then I imagined, living in a world where we could all put on our uh our oculus and like you and me and somebody from like uh chipas mexico and like all these other places that we talked about could sit down in a room together uh and actually talk to each other and like build global solidarity together in the way that we would on a, in a much more like personal seeming way than we currently do with like discord or podcasts or Twitter. Like there's this in like just incredible untapped potential for uh relationship building that exists there that um, I'm, I hope overtakes the, uh, the capacity for doing 
absolute carnage <laughs> that that technology presents itself with. But, uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm trying to imagine like walking somebody through a first person experience of this is how the system truly is. And let me show you what it's like to, to live in the, the global South or the part of your country that you never get to experience. Yeah, that's the thing you said, um, you said having people sit down at a table, but I'm thinking like, imagine being able to travel the world and like walk around in people's neighborhoods to have like, this, mm-hmm. this might be, that actually this might be a bit like privacy invasive, but like walk to walk through like someone else's neighborhood and mm-hmm. plan with them, you know? Yeah, yeah. Or like a uh, like walk through um, a forest, or yeah, and or, then or learn like... about the various aspects of geology. Have like uh, of, of ecology rather to take like like you know those god games where you really mm-hmm. have that zoomed out perspective mm-hmm. to be able to take a zoomed out perspective on the earth itself, and to be able to like imagine a game where you could manipulate time and move through space and basically see how various actions impact mm. the environment like this is uh, um in the game i'm see i saw on steam recently i played a, a demo trailer uh, a demo version for uh the name escapes me at the moment but essentially you are uh in this wasteland and your job is to restore it hmm. into like wildlife and to bring the wildlife back to bring the water back to you know heal it of the poison that was inflicted upon it um I think a more a, an idea more developed than that, yeah, has like it, I think it could expand people's perspective and really ties back to learning theory, learning politics through gaming. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, or like uh, another example, real quick. Mm-hmm. Um, if you look at like Minecraft, right? Right. Imagine of I've seen like several video essays on this. Is it's part of what's fueling me here? Um. Imagine a version of Minecraft where you actually had to be conscious of your ecological impact. Oh, yeah. That would completely transform people's approach to the game and yeah. likely people's approach to life. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it would certainly... Uh, I, I, uh, I do still stream, but I basically just play Stardew Valley on Twitch uh, and I don't uh, talk to people. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, I... I try to keep it as wholesome as I can. Um, but yeah, even in that like little happy farm simulator, if you had to actually pay attention to the ecological impact you were having on your environment, it would be a completely different experience. Um, I uh, like you can see all of the environmentalism leaving my body as I deforest the entire <laughs> island <laughs> uh, to build kegs to fuel my my blueberry wine capitalist <laughs> venture. Uh, <laughs> So, but and that's I, the thing, right? These games are um are informed by a capitalist logic, right? But yeah, there I think there are any developers who could take a different approach as well. Yeah, and uh, and to uh, to that developer's credit, like the big bad guy in the game is basically Walmart, but uh, unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, the good ending doesn't have you getting rid of Walmart. It basically has you replacing them with your farm. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a cute game and I really dig it, but, uh, like, I think it could be, uh, I think there's room, like you said, for, for, uh, for that whole space to be explored by people who are interested in teaching and exploring and trying to get us to come together in a, in a way that we heretofore have not been able to. And, uh, I, I'm really looking forward to the applicate that application of the technology, um, yeah. especially as the, the way that it's distributed and worked upon becomes more and more horizontal. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Um, all right, man. Well, I think we're coming up on time. I, I really appreciate you talking to me. Is there anything else that you want to touch on before we get out of here? No, I think this is a natural conclusion. I really enjoy talking to you as well. Um, yeah. Like, it didn't go in the exact direction we planned <laughs> with hey. anarchism, then black anarchism, and so the fun. But That's, the, I appreciate people, the, the natural evolution yeah. of the chat, and um, I had a really good time. 
Same. I, and anybody who's listening who's disappointed that we didn't touch on all that stuff, uh, if you go over to St. Andrew's YouTube page, uh, which I will link to in the show notes, you can find videos on all of that stuff. Uh, and he covers it wonderfully. And uh, and uh, you can just take this conversation as a, as a fun time. And uh, we're not here for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 we were um, just we were just chilling at the coffee you know <laughs> yeah yeah but um no everybody go check out saint andrew's channel uh it's absolutely wonderful um and i really enjoyed the conversation i'm glad uh glad we were finally able to get together do you have anybody that uh you want to plug or anything that you want to shout out to people while we're here before we get out of here um i can't think of any right now but um yeah yeah, if you th- if you think anybody, uh, just DM me and I'll throw it in the show notes. But uh, otherwise, man, it was uh, it was a good time. I, I'll I hope to I hope to talk to you again at some point, man. Thanks for yeah, coming on. Absolutely, thanks for having me. Take care. <laughs>